my parents came to the U.S. Uh, there was uh, three major waves of of the boat uh, the the boat people after the war, and they were part of the third wave, which was in 1980-ish, like around there. And I was 18 months old, so oh. I basically grew up most of my life in uh, in the uh, U.S. And my father was from Saigon, the south, and my mom was from Bam Kong, which is like a small village uh, about four hours north of uh, Saigon. Both my parents <laughs> were a little bit too young. Um, I think by by the end of uh, um, I mean the end of the war uh, for the Americans in seventy five. You know, the war kind of went on like a little bit longer. You know. Sure. And then there were all the the the, uh, uh, the border wars and stuff. But um, yeah. uh, my father was only uh, I think fifteen or so, fourteen or fifteen uh, or thereabouts. Um, you know, uh, he and my mother got uh, you know, married before they left. So I mean, they were like eighteen, nineteen. So they uh, so my dad didn't have any um direct uh, participation in the war, but. Of course, being from like Saigon, you know, uh, he had plenty of uh, more immediate family members who were involved, you know, some as mm. uh, commissioned officers, like as well. With the South Vietnamese side? Yes. The the ARVN, I guess. Right, the ARVN. Most people got like, just put in like just re-education camps, you know, so... They kind of like just like disappeared for like a while and then were reintegrated back into society once the government deemed that they were uh, fit to return as a uh, private citizen. What motivated your parents to um, to come to the States? And well, I guess, well, let me, yeah, sure. Let me ask that question first. What motivated them to leave the country that they'd grown up in, the country they knew, to go to a very different one. I remember one thing um, my parents talked a lot about growing up was uh, after the war, like life became very difficult for for South Vietnamese, especially people living in Saigon, because mm -hmm. one of the first things that uh, the um, the new communist government did when they came in was. To, to better manage uh, uh, Saigon, which I think at that time was something like three million people, they uh, they forcibly like relocated a mass number of of the people that were living in Saigon. So like uh, you know, um, one of the things uh, my father always told me was uh, he, at that time he was a teenager, you know, at the fall of uh, Saigon. So he was there when when it happened. And uh, he would tell me uh, that after, you know, the fall of Saigon, uh, you know, in in those that first year or in those months ahead, um, like people that he would know, like, you know, like family friends, you know, he'll be playing with his friends like one day just hanging out. And, you know, and the next thing you know, like their entire family got like relocated, you know, without knowledge beforehand. Really, so like he lost a lot of friends that way, uh, growing up, and he had no idea, you know. But uh, but the main one of the main factors was uh, because I was born, mm -hmm. and uh, to my parents, uh, it just didn't seem like they they weighed the uh, you know the future, uh, you know, because uh, the, the American government at that time had opened had still had this open door kind of policy, right? But they didn't know how much longer it was going to be open, and as it turned out, you know, after I think 1980 uh, or thereabouts, you know, uh, it, it wasn't open for that much longer. So they took up that opportunity, uh, and it was my dad said it was really hard to get a job, you know, uh, you know, um, in in, after, in Saigon, uh, yeah, yeah, it was very very difficult because, uh, you know, all of the good jobs were given to, you know. Uh, people that had associations with the new government or align themselves so yeah how did your parents you know what what route did they take and you know 
some background to that question. When I was in the Navy, I think this was in 1988, I think, I was on an aircraft carrier and um, we just got word that a ship was sinking, you know, relatively close by. So we went out and our helicopters and others aboard the carrier, you know, got these people off the sinking ship. And it turned out that they were Vietnamese boat people. That was the term used at that time. Typical, you know, 19 year old kid, I didn't really pay much attention to it and didn't think think very much about it. I mean, you know, I noticed it at the time and that's kind of interesting, but I didn't think much about it. But, you know, there were these folks out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and they would have died had not by, you know, circumstance, the this um, aircraft carrier had been close enough to to find out what was going on and to rescue them. And I know that a lot of Vietnamese who fled the country did die. Their ships sank and they went down in storms and things like that. So um, for many, it was an extremely dangerous journey. Um, how about your parents? What what route did they take? How did things go for them? Yeah, so um, from both my father's side and my mother's side, they were uh, uh, the only ones to actually leave. So, you know, I, I have very uh, limited knowledge of my relatives beyond my parents. Like, you know, I've I hear stories about their grandparents, but you know, uh, and, you know, all of my uncles and aunts and stuff like I, you know, it's uh, in, in the US, it's just me, my brother and my parents, and we kind of form, I mean, that's just the family that I know. Um, So when they left, I, it was like with many <clears throat> other uh, uh, boat people that that left, uh, they, they paid like a, a kind of a guide, right. And Lots of, you know, these guides were like in it for for the money. So they were taking these basically like river fishing boats out to sea, which is not a good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And you just jam them with as many people as possible. So um, I think my parents got got very uh, uh lucky. They were only out at sea for two days, um, uh, before they were picked up. Uh in international waters. And then they got put in a refugee camp. I've got this uh, great photo of them on like the white sand beaches, you know, and I was, you know, like really young, uh, 18 months, I, I guess, wow. but uh, yeah. And, and, and from there, uh, uh, they were given the option, uh, my father says, uh, they were given the option of going to Canada, like right away or they could wait to try to get into the US. And, you know, and my my father's favorite TV show when he was growing up in Saigon was uh, Bonanza, <laughs> you know, because uh, the US servicemen would get all these Western TV shows. So he grew up on like things like Bonanza, you know? So he was like, we're going to the US, you know, I don't, you know, we can wait in this refugee camp for however long. Turns out it was like six months, you know, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, and that's, and they got very lucky, you know, uh, yeah. because during that time, those waters were infested with uh, pirates, you know, people don't think about piracy in like the 20th century, but man, like that area was notorious and it was, they would board those ships and just like, just start robbing people and killing people and yeah. I've heard um I've heard of reference a lot of references to pirates from Thailand especially. Yep. And um Yeah, they they were uh, usually from uh, Thailand. Where did your parents settle in the states? Yeah, um so they initially got like sponsorship uh they came in to the states um I believe through uh Seattle but they ended up in uh, Pasco, Washington. I mean, if, no, it's in Eastern Washington. It's very like rural and agricultural. Yeah, you know, and that's where they were in initially, uh, uh, like like set up, you know, through like Section Eight housing and stuff. So and that's where some of my like first like memories like formed. You know, there was this like uh um little 
uh, neighborhood because when all these immigrants were coming over, a lot of them, you know, ended up uh, in like the West Coast kind of cities, you know, like Los Angeles, San Francisco and and these major metropolitan areas. But I, I, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I think just from somebody they might have known or something, but they ended up uh, in a very rural part of uh, Eastern Washington, you know, and some of my first memories of like this building were, uh, it was just like concrete. I remember the floors just being concrete and like very cold, like all the time. And also one, you know, one of our, uh, and one of the very first Christmases that I can remember, uh, a uh, Santa Claus came by to, you know, to give like gifts, you know, they would go, you know, they, they had like somebody maybe from the Salvation Army or something like that. Yeah. And uh, um, my dad's name was Ho, you know, like Ho Tran. So um, when this guy in a red suit and this white beard knocks on the door, my dad answers it, and, and the guy's like, ho, ho, ho. Oh, no. Now, it really freaked out my dad. And that was his kind of first uh, uh, introduction to uh, Santa Claus. But uh, we, we ended up in Hermiston, Oregon after a year in Pasco. And uh, they both found work at... Uh, it's now owned by Con Agra. It's called Lamb Weston. And they process uh, frozen potato products. And both of them uh, just retired uh, just like this last year. So they were with the company for about 40 years. Wow. Yeah, like 40 something years. So. And did they live near or uh, among other others who had come over from Vietnam? In, in Hermiston, there are a few families. Um, maybe two or three in Pasco, there were more because it was more of a, um, they, they, uh, after the war, more immigrants uh, got sent there, you know, maybe they just had the infrastructure for it, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but during, uh, like celebrations and stuff, it, we would always go up to uh, Eastern Washington, which, which was about an hour from Hermiston. You know, and there, there's quite a few families out there now, you know, but they're going into like second and third generation. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. What is your parents, if, you know, it might be hard to describe, but what is your parents' relationship with Vietnam today? Um, you know, how do they, what do they think about the country now? What's their do they feel in any way connected with that country still? How would you describe their relationship with Vietnam? Um, yeah, I, I still think they're uh, they're they're connected to it. Uh, I mean, they, they still have family there, you know. Um, well, when uh, even up until like a few years ago, um, I I had this impression that that when they retired, that. Uh, and one of two things was going to happen that they were going to want to move back because they talked about it so much growing up, you know, I'm like, you know, you're retired. Like, why not? You know, like, you know, uh, 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 myself and my brother, you know, we're like fully grown adults. We can like go visit you or like, you know, you come visit us. But, um, you know, they've grown up in a rural part of, Oregon and in the U.S., you know, for the ma majority of like their lives now, like they're well into like their 60s. Mm. So it's so, it, you know, so when uh, I bring up the question, you know, so what are you guys going to do? You stay in Hermiston, you know, or, you know, for so for them, it's like uh, going out to like Vietnam, like every few years to visit for a month or two is fine. But they've kind of gotten used to, you know, it's it's too uh they they have a hard time acclimating to to the weather there. Mm, uh, in the humidity. You know, it, yeah, they they're just like not used to it because like they've, you know, like spent, you know, since they were 20, like out in, in the US. If you were uh with your parents in a store, and perhaps this has happened, and they see an American veteran of the vietnam war who has a hat you know that says vietnam veteran on it and i'm sure you've seen that um 
have you ever heard i mean have your do your parents when they see those veterans do they interact with them at all or if they don't do you have any idea what kinds of thoughts they have about about that i, I understand that they were too young to participate yeah. but obviously everything that led to them leaving is a consequence yeah. of the war the the north winning that war and taking over the yeah. south and then you know making life hard for a lot of people in the south do you have any thoughts about if they don't actually talk to those veterans what kind of thoughts they might have when they see that veteran with the vietnam yeah, veteran hat? yeah i think m m my dad um uh like like these days will go out of, of his way to like talk to a veterans if if it's something that they want to do you know um yeah you know he he uh He's always like curious uh, about the kind of stuff. Um, I I think uh, when we were younger and when he was younger and when all of like the vets were considerably younger, it it was different, you know. Um, definitely people would like look at us uh like a certain way, you know. And also, you know, you, you always take like kind of parents like warnings like about you know like like little things, you know. It just be like, hey, you know. You know, if you see like these people just kind of like stay out of their way, you know, don't don't try to like cause trouble or, you know, say anything that that might make them do something like I don't know what, you know, because as a kid, you just like listen to your parents. But, you know, but I think as, um, you know, that word generation has has uh, gotten older, you know, there is more. I think curiosity like about Vietnam and like it's people and like the country like out outside of just the memories of like the tours in like Vietnam. So uh, these days, yeah, he, if he sees like a, a guy, you know, uh, with a, a Vietnam war hat or like the, the old like Vietnamese flag, you know, and the American flag on like one side, you know, he'll be like, Hey, you know, like, uh, so you were in the war, like, like, where were you, you know, like, uh, like, what year, you know, and then if there's something, you know, uh, he, he can, like, connect, uh, like, the time period, then he'll, you know, you know, if that person's open to talking, and a, a lot of people are. You just um, use the word resentment, there's less resentment, and I'm interested in um, your thoughts about that. Would it be resentment on the part of and here we might be talking about the 80s or the 90s i, I think you're right it, it would be less so now would that be resentment on the part of the american veteran who thinks hey you know i went over there to help save your country and you know everything went down the drain and i'm resentful of that or is it resentment on the part of the former South Vietnamese who says, hey, you were with us and you abandoned us and that's why our country collapsed. And so we're resentful of that. Um, is it both or I'm just interested in your response to what you, what, um, yeah. what that word might mean to you? Yeah, I, you know, like I obviously can't uh, speak on, on behalf of, uh, you know, um, either American vets or like, uh, you know, the book people that, sure. that, that came over. Like, I don't think m my parents had any kind of uh, resentment, you know, like, um, cause I mean, they were younger. They also hadn't, didn't have direct particip participation in the war, but, um, I mean, they were there when like all of it was going on. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I can see the the resentment, and you know, there's uh, at least some level on on like both sides. Uh, you know, um, in uh, Missoula, Montana, where I lived off and on for more than twenty years, there's a substantial Hmong population. You know, and and the Hmong like were the ones that got like effed over the worst by like the CIA. You know, um, like the CIA like gave them like all these promises and like, you know, and they basically allowed like uh, the use of like Hmong land, uh, Hmong land to like land, you know, like airplanes and do surveillance and stuff. And, you know, and I remember asking uh, some of the Hmong from, 
from there, uh, you know, and they don't have any uh, resentment. I, I think it's just kind of more uh, ingrained into uh, like, like the Vietnamese kind of, uh, or maybe the Pan-Asian like mindset, you know, it's, it's less like, like uh, I've read that you've gone back to, to Vietnam. I'm sure you've talked to people and there's, you know, uh, people are like always like forward looking, you know, like uh, there's, there's less of this, like, yeah. like, like uh, I, it might be too strong of a word, but like a uh, less of maybe a fixation or an obsession on kind of like the past, you know, whereas, you know, you have people like Bao Nin, who is like kind of rare because he is like, you know, he's just like, that war has like defined like his, like his life. So, um, but for like a lot of people there, they, yeah, you know, like the war was terrible, but it's also, you know, you're alive now and it's time to like, kind of look toward the future. You know, one that he always likes telling is uh, on April 30th, 1975 in the fall of Saigon, like he was there and just like the atmosphere, just like the panic, um, you know, everybody was just like, what are we, you know, going to do? Like, basically, the world seemed like it was ending, you know, like, um, the communists were at the gates, they were shelling the airport, like all this like stuff, you know, like fires were going off and like, helicopters, you know, it, it, it was just total uh, pandemonium, you know. Um, so he likes talking about that. And just like, you know, after the war, because it was, you know, he was a teenager, and he's just, he still hung out with, like this, his group of friends. But, you know, it was so hard to find work that what they did was um, they would scavenge, like, the jungle outside the city for just, like, uh, abandoned, like, uh, munitions and, like, anything of value. And they would take it back into the city and and uh, they, they would sell these, like, parts for uh, in, in the... Uh, the black market, like the underground uh, economy for things like rice and like things like that, you know? So there was a thriving um, like black market in Saigon after the war, because, you know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, like restrictions and controls being, being imposed that uh, a lot of people there like weren't used to up until that point. How would you describe your own relationship with Vietnam? I mean, you don't have any living memory of, being there you were just a baby when when your parents took you out um so how would you describe your own as you think about you know the things that make up who you are uh yeah. where does where does vietnam fit into that i think um uh like many um like immigrant children uh from vietnam uh like the the post-war you know the vietnamese like americans you know kind of that grew up here um so the um um I, I i feel like the 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 boat person story is like uh it's very like prototypical there's 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 a lot of uh the elements from it that that's shared by like the entire diaspora you know that grew up in the uh, us you know like growing up it was kind of about fitting in and being more like american you know um and at, at some point, you know, in my late teens, uh, my early 20s, when I was an undergraduate, I started gaining more interest in sort of like Vietnam and like, you know, I, of course, always knew about the war, but I didn't know that much about it. And what I learned from it was usually, you know, from like documentaries, you know, which was always portraying like the American side, obviously. I picked up uh, Robert Olin Butler's A Good Scent from a Strange Mountain. Hmm. I think that won the Pulitzer in like the early like 90s or something. But I read that. I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, uh, I should read more of this because I wasn't into war lit. Not, still not really. But, you know, it was about Vietnam in fiction form. So I, I read that. And then, of course, you know, uh, like Tim O'Brien's uh, The Things They Carried. You know, um, Graham Greene's *The Quiet uh, uh, American*, and uh, like like from there uh, into my late teens and early twenties, uh, then I started picking up uh, like anthologies that were translated from the Vietnamese, like short fiction. 
type of anthologies. That led me to, uh, you know, uh, it opened the, the door and I kept hearing about this Bao Nin guy. So I picked up the, the Sorrow of War. I was probably 20 and I read that. I was like, man, this is awesome. You know, like this is not like anything I've read. And it's and it was one of those books that I kind of carried around. And like, like you know, if I ran in, into, uh, you know, I would tell my friends to read and like, hey, you know, just, you know, over the years, I've probably given away like uh, six or seven copies of the Star of War. You know, I always have a couple copies on, on hand. The limited stuff I was reading out of Vietnam where it was, a lot of it was like celebrating the victory of, of war, you know, there was, and as though there were no like psychological consequences to like mm -hmm. fighting, you know, whether you win or lose. It, it was free of that kind of, uh, that that propaganda I was expecting out of like Vietnam, you know, that that towed the 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 communist line and celebrated like like the state and you know like David and and a Goliath kind of thing, you know. So it didn't do any of that. It, it was like, man, like this is it made me an alcoholic and I have problems having like a relationships with people. And you know, I can't like, you know, forget like any of this that's happening you know and and this is the, the person like in the that, novel this is the person yeah. in the novel talking about the consequences for him of having served in that war yeah you know and uh and it, it was obvious to me that uh that it was pulled like from his life and it was probably very close well, let's just put together a scenario um you are uh, invited to decide what book a discussion group will use and the discussion group, the people in the group are um, uh, Vietnamese living in the States. And most of them are in their 60s and you've got some in their early 70s. And so you show up at the meeting and you say, okay, well, the book that I would like to discuss is Bao Nin's um, Sorrow of War. And somebody asked you, well, who's Bao Nin? Well, he was a soldier. Who, he was a North Vietnamese soldier um, who served in the war, um, you know, against the South. How do you think that would be received? So I, I guess really the, the, the general question is, how is Bao Nin's work received among Vietnamese in the States is, and again, I know you're going to have variety, but what's your general perception? Would Vietnamese living in the States be interested, be interested in, open to reading a novel by a guy who had served with the North? If, if I were to show up, uh, uh, in to a book group, uh, of people in their sixties and seventies, um, um, who were uh, former Bo people that escaped Vietnam, uh, I would be run out of that group. Yeah. You know, uh, I think there is very little interest. Um, there might be, you know, um, I, you know, um, especially for people that, that are uh, the, the first generation that, that came over, you know, or can re remember the war, there's uh, very little interest in, in, you know, uh, um, Bao Nin or what the communists or uh, um, a communist soldier would have to say about the war, because they have their, uh, their own experiences, you know, like they remember it not be turning out very, very well. So, you know, when I, I was growing up, there was a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, talk uh, of, you know, parents will always tell, you know, like their kids to like, be wary of like, like the communists, you know, I, I picture it like, a, um, you know, maybe it's not uh, an apt, like a comparison, but like to the, the, the Miami Cubans, you know, like that, like that kind of thing, you know, there's, there's definitely a huge rift. And, you know, it, it would be like, if you were to give a you know, one of uh, the Cubans there who escapes like Fidel Castro, you know, like, you know, like, like, here's a, you know, a, 
a book by one of his like a lieutenants or a foot soldier, you know, or 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 chair or something, you know. Uh, I I think there would be very little interest, you know. Um, I mean, so, it, uh, yeah, might might it even be stronger? I mean, would some feel that in some way it was an act of betrayal on your part, maybe to be not only reading this guy's book, but you said you've given copies of the book to other people. I mean, would some people even feel like that? Like, why are you supporting somebody who was on the side that forced us to flee the country? Yeah, well, it, you know, it depends on like who you're talking about. Here's one great uh, um, example. Uh, so when uh, Hanoi at, at Midnight uh, came out, um, I gave my parents like a copy, like, of course. Uh, so, um, so my mom, like she held it, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the first thing that, that she said was, uh, uh, son, we're really proud of you, but who's going to read a book by a communist? You know, I've met older uh, Vietnamese people, uh, that, that my, my parents knew who refused to go back to Vietnam you know, um, that they came to the U.S. and they plan on on dying here in the U.S. because as soon as they left, they were like, you know, like this this country is is no longer mine. You know, it's it's not it's never going to be the way that it was. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm so I'm not going to go back. Let's change the scenario. And so now you've been asked to um, select a book. Um, that will be discussed by a group of American Vietnam vets. And so you select, uh, you you bring Bound in Sar of War, and then you also bring the collection of short stories, um, Hanoi at Midnight. And you say to the group of American Vietnam vets, you know, I recommend that we discuss one of these two books by this um, man who served with the North Vietnamese Army um, in the war. Um, and I imagine some American vets would be quite open to that. Um, perhaps others, um, you know, would 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 not be open to that. But if the question is, you know, well, why why would an American war veteran want to read something from a North Vietnamese soldier? What could an what could an American war veteran get from that? How do you suppose you might respond to that? Bound in uh, uh, first and foremost, you know, uh, if if you take away the 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 communists, like you know, I I, I know it's like it it can overshadow everything, you know. First mm -hmm. of all, he's also like a human being, you know. He has like feelings, you know. Like if 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 uh, that's, that's one thing that I think is great about people that love reading is like they're able to uh, um to have more like empathy. You know, because you're you're able to uh, imagine yourself as as these characters that you're reading, you know. So so I would uh, tell him that you know he's he's uh, you know first of all a human being like you know before he was a soldier and like you know and all of this stuff and he has like things that he writes and talks about that can that is uh, relatable to. Uh, to anyone you know you know it's it's not like like what he is 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 writing is like towing the the communist like ideology like not like at all you know mm. yeah you, you you've, you've yeah. said i mean I, I think his his work has been banned at different times right the government of vietnam has banned yeah um, his work right yeah, yeah. The the first uh, the start of war was banned for something like seventeen years. Bound in uh, is quoted um, famously as saying, "You know, in in war there aren't any winners and and losers. There's only you know death and uh, destruction or or something like that." But um, if I knew like nothing else like about the war, I'd read just those two books. Um, I would say uh, they're 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 very anti-war, you know. Mm -hmm. It it uh, it goes in also, uh, you know, in 
Hanoi at midnight, especially, you know, with, uh, cause there's multiple like characters, you know, um, you see that even in times of war, you know, like people still have to like go on like living like their lives, you know, they still want and desire like, like the same things, you know, they want companionship, they want, you know, to develop friendships, they want to make sure uh, their kids are doing okay. And all these these things uh, th that regular human beings like want and desire and need, you know, it doesn't change in times of war.